And I think one of the things that I would do differently if we started over is I would actually start selling later than we did. Sick. So welcome, Jeff, to the Indie Worldwide podcast. We're here today to talk about your company, Outsetta, which I just onboarded on last week. Thanks again for the help on that. Yeah, absolutely. You have uh, abnormal context having gone through that. So Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know if I'm an abnormally needy user, but you've been really helpful with my slew of um, support requests. So thanks awesome. for that. Yeah, of course. Thanks for your feedback throughout. It's been super helpful. You want to give us the, what's the elevator pitch for Outsetta? The one sentence, what the heck is it? Yeah. Um, the easiest way to describe it is it's an all-in-one tech stack to build a SaaS or membership business. So if you're building any sort of subscription business or startup with a recurring revenue model, you need all the same sorts of tools, subscription billing, CRM, email marketing, authentication, and Outsetta brings all that together in a single platform. And you've been working on this for how long? We actually, um, I was just thinking about this. We turned six years old tomorrow, or uh, October 1st, essentially. So quite a while. Wow, congrats. That's actually older than I expected. I thought that it was maybe a year old, maybe two years. I didn't expect six years. It is six years old. Yeah, we've, we've been up to it for a while. Um, we definitely did start kind of as a side project. And all of the three, there's three co-founders. We all started working on it part-time. Um, and really did so for two or three years while we were kind of getting the MVP out the door. And then the last three years or so, we've all been working on it full time. Oh, that's awesome. So three years as a side project, three years full time. People yeah. are often surprised, too, that Indie Worldwide is like four years old because it was like three and a half years side project, like a few months now. For sure. Full time. Yeah. Um, these things, they take a while to like get up and running. I think people underestimate how long for process it is they think oh i've been working on this for six months and i've only got 10 users and actually that's not bad traction necessarily absolutely everything takes twice as long as people think and uh you know all the t all the success stories that you hear online certainly there are some that come out of the gates and have some massive success in a year or two but um, there's a reason there's kind of this meme going around about everybody being a 10-year overnight success so is the current outset of this like unified CRM billing platform what you guys started out to build? Um, or was there some pivots along the way to get there? Uh, pretty much no pivots. There's been a mild pivot in our target market, but the, the product vision was exactly what we set out to build. Um, we basically launched a previous SaaS business and looked around at all the tools we were integrating and we were like, you know what, every other SaaS company needs all of these same tools. Why hasn't somebody built sort of a Shopify type platform for a SaaS business? Um, and, and that's what we've delivered. Um, like the core functionality has been exactly what we set out to build. I think one of the things that's interesting about Outsetta is everybody tells you, um, you know, you should start with one small piece of functionality, make it really good and then kind of branch out. Um, and mm. you see that in a lot of companies. You see that in HubSpot, for example. HubSpot started out, you know, as sort of a marketing automation, uh, inbound marketing tool, and then branched out into CRM and now payments and help desk and those sorts of things. Um, but to deliver on the value prop of Outsetta, we said we need all these tools to be sort of pre-integrated from the get-go. Um, and we kind of took a different approach, which is definitely a long-term approach, but it was like build the core CRM features, build the key billing features, build the key help desk features, and then just enrich mm -hmm. each of those feature sets over time. Um, so it's been an interesting, interesting journey. And a as you've seen, um, you know, there's areas of the product that are particularly around authentication and payments, pretty, pretty feature rich, pretty mature at this point. And then there's other areas that still need a little TLC. Yeah, I didn't realize that about HubSpot because I think of them also as this like behemoth, behemoth omni platform mm -hmm. thing. And I guess obviously they didn't start out that way. They got there over probably decades at this point. Do yeah, they see HubSpot as a primary competitor because they seem to be similar in some ways of like trying to do a lot of stuff. There's certainly. SaaS business. Yeah, they're certainly similar in a lot of ways. Um, if you look at their feature set and ours, um, there's a ton of overlap at this point. It's almost the same. The main difference at this point is we also include authentication features, um, which is interesting. I've always been surprised that HubSpot doesn't because that unlocks a lot of useful functionality when combined with your, your billing and CRM mm. features. 
But the way that we look at it in short, um, no, I don't really look at HubSpot as a competitor. There's other companies I certainly look at as more direct competitors. And the reason that I say that is even HubSpot, they, they say that um, they kind of care about startups and they want to serve young businesses and all that. But their their business is kind of scale up companies. And as I, I would describe that, like when companies are at $10 million in revenue and scaling up, that's when HubSpot is a great fit. And frankly, that's when Outsetta becomes not a great fit. Like our, our objective mm-hmm. is to sort of serve the lower end of the market and take you from day zero, hopefully to five or $10 million in revenue. And then it's totally okay, but you're going to outgrow Outsetta and move on to something like HubSpot. I think it makes sense to why they don't have like a no code authentication system built in because for their customers, if they're already doing 10 million a year, they've already figured out off. Like they Absolutely. hired an engineer, yep. uh, 5 million, ARR ago to do that for them, right? For sure. Um, is the does that make the end goal like get HubSpot to buy you, <laughs> so no. that you can fill that fill that gap? No, we um, it, interestingly enough, that conversation has already been had. Um, HubSpot oh. built pay, built payments uh, last year and uh, basically came and inquired as to whether our team would be interested in coming and building their payments product. Uh, and, and the short answer was no, um, we're, we're not really building out Seta with the objective of selling the company in mind. Um, we want to mm-hmm. operate this business for the next 10 plus years and um, you know reap financial rewards via profit sharing and uh, those sorts of things rather than focusing on an acquisition. How big is the Outsetta team right now? Like how many co-founders and how many employees? Yeah, there's six of us today. Um, three of us are co-founders, um, two other people working full time, and then we have a contractor or two contributing to projects as well. Nice. And are you comfortable talking about how uh, your MRR? Uh, we don't share MRR publicly. Uh, I can tell you, you know, we're well over five figures and not yet at a million. Um, basically okay. being like a mission critical software business. Um, we think once you kind of get through those early stages of growth, there's not too much benefit uh, to sharing MRR. I, I think we will announce when we get to a million just because it's kind of interesting context for other companies. Um, but aside from that, it's not something we share. So somewhere above a hundred grand, but not near to a million yet. And maybe we can extrapolate from there. Um, so six years, were you profitable from year one? How were you funding it? Yeah, we, we self-funded the business. Um, you know, at this point, we're, we're sort of in the free and um, we control our own destiny. In the very early years, um, there was a time where we burned a very small amount of money. Uh, but we've basically just been doing the profitable growth route and reinvesting uh, any sort of profits into the company, the team, etc. Nice. And this wasn't either of you guys' first um, SaaS company, right? Like you'd been building software before this. We have, yes. So um, the company came out of our experience growing another company called Buildium. Uh, it's the word build and then IUM.com. Uh, that was co-founded by my now co-founder, Dimitri. Um, and the idea for Outsetter was kind of spawned in the context of, of growing that business. Um, I was kind of the needy business user and Dimitri was the CTO. And I was saying, you know, we need HubSpot for marketing uh, automation. We need Zendesk. We need to integrate Stripe for billing. And Dimitri was just like, you know what, in the context of an early stage bootstrap company, this is kind of crazy. I'm spending half of my time evaluating and integrating software products rather than building our core product. Um, and we recognize that for a you know bootstrap company uh, or a single technical founder, there's a real opportunity cost there. And that's ultimately what kind of spawned the idea for Outsetta. This is the benefit or this is what happens once you start a company is you suddenly get a bunch of ideas for other companies, maybe even better products you could build. And I feel like a lot of people, they start out and they're like, man, I definitely want to be an entrepreneur, but I don't know what the heck to even build. Like, what would people yeah. pay me for? And as soon as you're building anything, it's like, oh my gosh, there's so many problems. Uh, why isn't someone building like X, Y, and Z too? Yeah. Um, and then you have too many things to build and you have to try to figure out what to focus your attention on. For sure. I, I will admit, uh, Outsetta is in some ways a laughable idea. Like they, they tell you in startup land, do not build SaaS for other indie hackers, for other SaaS companies, for other startups. And we're doing all of those things. Um, so I, I get... Um, you know, why, why that's amusing and in a lot of ways, why this is an unattractive target market. 
Uh, but to your to your point, like it's a set of problems that we're intimately familiar with. Uh, and when we looked around, there's no one else trying to solve the problem in the way that we are. So uh, we think there's an opportunity here, even if it isn't like the perfect startup idea on paper. Yeah, I feel like that advice is um, maybe given a little bit too much, right? Like lots of products when they start are just for other startup founders. Um, but once they mature, are useful for lots of business owners, not just startup founders, right? Sure. Uh, like Stripe was built just for like other people at the zero stage trying to set up payments. Now they're yeah. for anybody that wants to collect payments, right? Absolutely. Um, I think it's only a bad idea if you don't have any way to grow beyond the, your initial niche. But at the very beginning, I think indie hackers are actually great customers because they're they know how to build products, so they know how to give good feedback, and they're also more willing to try out something brand new that isn't exactly bulletproof yet, too. Totally good point. Agreed. The thing I really like about it, said actually, is the fact that it's not trying to do... Um, it is doing a lot for you, but it's not trying to be your product, right? So how you deliver your actual product can be swapped out, and you can still keep out Seta. Um, I think that's what makes it really useful, especially for the people trying to build no code products, because there's so many different ways to build a no code product, right? And uh, no matter how you build the product itself, you're going to want some kind of auth system. Um, but not all of them, not all the solutions for building no code products are going to have like authentication and stuff built in. Uh, for sure. Which I think is where outside it becomes really useful. Like I'm using it on top of um, a card website plus a feather website, and neither of those things have a way to do auth. But yep. outside it does, and it works on top of both of them at once, which is pretty magical for for my my use case. Yeah, that, that's definitely been a key part of our strategy. Like our thinking is however you want to deliver your SaaS product or your website or your community or whatever it is, go pick the platform that you like and we'll make it easy for Outsetta to, to plug into that platform. Um, I think that's really the biggest difference between Outsetta and something like a Shopify. We have a lot of people that hear, and I use it all the time. I use the Shopify for SaaS analogy, but a lot of people that hear that say, you know, where where's the front end? Like, um, you know, Shopify mm. gives you an actual website outside. It doesn't give you a website or a front end to a SaaS product. Um, so, you know, we're a little bit different in the sense that we're trying to be tech stack agnostic. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out, but I feel like it, like there's always going to be new platforms coming out too, that people want to build out on and they're not going to yep. have off out of the box probably. Um, yep. so it seems like it will continue to be useful. Uh, let's roll it back a little bit to how you guys got off the ground. Um, what was the story of like zero users to like first hundred paying users? Yeah, good question. Um, that was hard <laughs> to, to be honest with you. That was really hard for us. Um, with the size of what we've built, Outsetta is really more like three or four different software products than one. And as I said, we started mm -hmm. part-time. So it, it really took us two years to deliver what I would call a functional MVP um, that had like really basic subscription billing, really basic email marketing, really basic CRM. And I think one of the things that I would do differently if we started over is I would actually start selling later than we did. Um, you know, mm -hmm. everyone tells you like, get the product out the door, get it in the hands of users, get feedback. Um, and I think that advice is typically well-intentioned, but in the markets that we serve, it's so competitive. People are so familiar with technology. Um, I think that actually hurt us to some extent early on. And the reason for that is, you know, I was reaching out and I was saying, you know, we've got this all in one tech stack. These are all the tools you need. Come look at it. And founders would look at the product and they'd say, oh, you know, this is a pretty underwhelming CRM and a pretty <laughs> underwhelming email marketing tool. And they, they weren't wrong. Like I was excited about it because it was my startup. But the truth is like the competitive products that were out there were better. And the benefits of all the products that we offer being stitched together weren't, wasn't that strong yet. Um, so mm -hmm. I think we learned the hard way um, that sometimes it's better to launch with something beyond like a minimum viable product. And secondarily, one of the biggest learnings from our journey was we started out specifically focused on selling to founders of SaaS companies. Um, and, and typically that's like a single technical founder. And while that's still a big part of our business, about 50% of our customers are actually building SaaS products and are developers. 
Um, what we realized uh, through our first like three or four years in business was we were trying to change the predominant behavior of developers. We were saying, we're offering you this solution that gives you speed to market, uh, but you're going to make some trade-offs and you're not going to build you know, the perfect auth system and integrate it with all the other tools um, as perfectly as you're capable of doing. Um, so we, we worked really hard. It took us, I think, close to four years to get 100 customers, to be honest with you, uh, maybe like wow. three and a half. Um, and then shortly after that point, we were kind of discovered by the no-code community um, very organically. And what we recognized through those early conversations with no coders is they needed all the same tooling and they didn't have the technical skill set to tie all this stuff together. So I said it was that much more valuable to a, a no code type founder. Um, and that's really kind of when we hit our first inflection point in growth. Um, it was driven more by no coders than by technical founders. And now mm -hmm. that the product has matured and I think is much more compelling than it was in those early days, we've actually seen the SaaS founders kind of come roaring back and we have a customer base that's roughly split uh, between no coders and developers. I like how all your advice is like the opposite of the common advice. It's, <laughs> you know, like don't get customers too fast because your product's probably shitty and it's, uh, you know, just put all the features together at once because like that is the core premise of your product is it does a bunch of things. So actually you can't launch that lean of a product. Um, yeah, I, like, I, that, that's what's missing. I mean, that's what's missing in the startup world is, is like the context around what you're building, right? You hear all these common uh, start like bits of startup advice, but do they apply to every product? No. And what, like what we're building is pretty uncommon in the size of what we're building. And the fact that we're building for this crazy competitive market already, like it, it does predicate that we do things quite, quite differently and that's okay. And I wish that there was more conversation about sort of the nuance between your strategy and your product idea and your market than there typically is. To be fair, I don't think most indie founders could pull off a product like this, right? Like your advantages are yeah. you're starting mm -hmm. as a team, right? You have got co-founders, you're starting with a budget because you've got previous successes and you know you have enough time to like work on this and pull off a grander vision. Most people, they're the solo founder, right? They don't have enough time or budget to do this as their first product. They need something that they can get sales on within yep. hopefully the first couple months because clock's ticking and they need a runway. That's, that's absolutely fair, absolutely accurate. Uh, and even with the team that, that we had being a pretty senior experienced team, uh, I mean, the first, first three or four years were brutal and it's only the last two, three years where it's kind of blossomed into a business um, that's self-sustaining and giving us the lifestyle that we want. Mm. I think your guys' story might reveal like a necessary distinction between bootstrapped and self-funded, right? Like bootstrapped sure. is starting with no money or like yeah. a couple months of runway and trying to go from that to something more versus like self-funded where it's like, this is yeah. arguably like a venture funded idea. You just were able to skip the venture step because you could self-fund. That is true. Um, but I would say we're much more bootstrapped than you would expect. Even this year, like our total spend on everything marketing related is going to be like, Ten or fifteen thousand dollars, I think. Um, that that's it. So, where is that marketing budget going? Are you running ads or like newsletter? Doing no no ads whatsoever. Or? It's mostly just tools. Um, honestly, I think our biggest expense at this point is just video hosting. Uh, we post a lot of videos mm -hmm. and use Wistia. Uh, but every, I mean, certainly like my time goes into marketing, but um, mm -hmm. we basically don't sponsor anything. We don't do any paid ads. It's all content marketing, SEO, affiliates, um, that kind of stuff. Um, you got to give it a try. See if you can get some uh, return on investment because now you might For be sure. able to grow even faster. Uh, yeah. So the zero to 100, we talked about how hard it was. But we didn't actually talk about how you did it. So was this all like sure. cold outreach to get those first hundred? Yeah, a few a few things of note in that that first hundred and uh, shameless plug. We we actually do have a course that we've released called the first five hundred. I don't know if you've checked that out yet, Anthony, but um, you mm -hmm. have free access to it as an outside of customer. Um, oh, so that nice. shows you like exactly how we got our first five hundred customers. But the first hundred, um, a couple a couple 
sort of key pillars to that, I guess. We started writing content the same day we started writing code. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's hard for me to quantify the impact that that had on our first 100 customers, but that was certainly how we started getting our name out there. And one of the things I think we did differently was I really focused on our early content marketing um, as an investment in our brand more than an investment in like organic search traffic. Um, and we publish very infrequently, but we try to make it high quality posts that we publish. And I think we started to build an audience of people that liked our content quite early on. Um, and that was definitely one of the key strategies uh, on the way to the first 100. The other two things um, that are a little bit more brute force, as you might expect um, in that really early journey um, was, was email marketing. Um, so we, we did do um, just kind of like looking at sites like Product Hunt and Angels List for new SaaS businesses that were launching and reached out to them and introduced what it was that we were building and we're a Stripe partner and, and all of that. Um, that was where a lot of those early sales conversations came from probably the most. Uh, and then the third bit is just what I would call like community marketing, um, which is there's all these communities like yours out there um, and just being an active participant in those types of communities, um, not selling within those communities, just kind of being there, people recognize mm -hmm. what we were doing. And I think email prospecting and community marketing were sort of how we brute forced our way to the first hundred users or so. Was the split from the beginning, like you're on marketing, your other founders are on coding, like how did you guys divvy up responsibilities? Yeah. Um, the reason, the reason we, there's basically two reasons we chose to work together. Um, one was we had a lot of philosophical alignment around how we want to build the company. The second was just we have very complementary skills. So my background, um, I still think of myself as a, a marketer, um, but my other two co-founders are a back-end developer and a front-end developer. So between the three of us, we had a, sort of the basic skill set that we needed to be dangerous. That's a really like perfect combo for yeah. bootstrapping a startup. Nice. And if you guys been, were you working all in person at first and then went remote because of the pandemic, you remote now? What's the like day to day looking like? We're a hundred, a hundred percent remote. Um, we always have been, uh, although we are all initially from the Boston area. That's where we all sort of met and worked together previously. Um, and mm -hmm. now Dave is in Boston, but I'm in San Diego and Dimitri is in Greece. So we're, we're about as far okay, away wow. as you can get at this point. Um, we run everything completely asynchronously. We have a single meeting a week. Um, it is on Mondays, uh, but it, it's an hour long. And other than that, um, it's just all communication through Slack and whatnot. Nice. I feel like now more than ever, that's a really big competitive advantage. Like nobody really wants to go work for a company where they have to go into an office. A lot of people strongly prefer the option to be remote always. Um, yeah. And I think especially if most of your staff are like developers, then it's kind of hard not to be remote first nowadays. Yeah, I, I've actually, uh, I've been working remotely since 2013. Um, when I was working for Dimitri at this previous company, um, I sort of fell in love with the job and had wanted to move to California um, previously, but I knew I'd sort of landed at a good company. I stayed there and worked in Buildium's office in Boston for three years. And I got to the point where I went into his office one day and I said, you know, I, I love this company, but I need to go work remotely or I need to quit. And at that point, you know, remote work was something people largely didn't do. Um, I was given the freedom mm -hmm. to do so and uh, sort of recognized through that experience that having an employer that let me do that and let me sort of prioritize the things that were important in my life actually made me fiercely loyal to that company and even just to Dimitri as a person. Um, and at this point, like, I can't imagine telling employees that, you know, they don't have the freedom to go do the things that are important to them in their personal life. And um, we'll always be 100% remote. There's no question about that. And like, personally, I don't think at this point I would ever work at a business that didn't give me that freedom. Um, really like no matter how compelling the offer was. Do you, now that you're like the business owner, do you see any downsides for remote work? Um, I think it, I don't think this is a downside, but I think it does, force you to hire more deliberately and hire slower. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in the context of like a really fast growing company that that could certainly be something of a hindrance. But 
one of my like most closely held business beliefs anyways is you hear people for the lack of a better phrase like bitch and moan about how difficult hiring is but they're yeah. putting like 10 percent of the effort into hiring that they're putting into product or sales or marketing and it's like at the end of the day your ability to hire is going to dictate how much success your business has as highly as just about anything. Um, so I, I actually think that uh, sort of needing to slow down and be more deliberate in, in hiring because you are hiring people remotely and there is kind of some more risk in doing so um, can, can be a good thing. Outside of that, like what everyone else says, I do think it's important, um, you know, that you get to know people on a personal level. That's obviously harder from uh, a remote perspective. And I do think there's a lot of benefits to getting the team together semi-regularly. Um, I don't have a strong opinion on, on cadence, but uh, even with Dimitri being in Greece and Dave being in Boston, we make a point to try to get together every three or six months um, to the extent that we can. And I think, you know, everyone always leaves those in-person sessions kind of refreshed and motivated and happy that you did meet in person. What does hiring deliberately look like for you guys? Like what's in your hiring pipeline that makes you confident that the people you hire are going to be good at their jobs? Yeah, that's, that's a good question too. Um, I think one thing that we will do a lot of, um, certainly, and, and I admit that there are downsides to this, but we'll hire a lot of people that are sort of within our network that we've worked with before. Um, and I say that there's a negative there, uh, because it is very important to us that we open up positions publicly and are providing equal access to, to people and, and all those sorts of things. Um, so I, I don't want to say like we're going to hire from this small defined pool of people, but we've done some of that so far. Like our lead designer, James, is somebody I'd worked with previously. And, um, you know, you just have a higher degree of confidence bringing someone that you've worked with before onto the team because you know them to some extent. Mm. But for kind of net new hires, um, I think something we're going to do with most people is start them out with some sort of project, uh, a paid project where they do have an opportunity to work with us to see how they would contribute to the team to see what our working style is. Um, and doing those things, I think, is a good practice around hiring anyways. Um, and they're like, particularly the way that we're building our, our company, part of the reason we want to stay small and independent and profitable is so we don't have to chase growth at all costs and we don't ever have to put ourselves yeah. in a situation where it's like, oh, we need to hire a sales rep and we have two weeks to do it because the VC says so. Um, so I think just giving ourselves time to, you know, run a run a real hiring process where we bring in a wide variety of candidates, um, you know, go through the best ones uh, and offer them contract opportunities or offer them some sort of uh, ability to contribute before they actually come onto the team in a full-time capacity. I think those are really the best things you can do to de-risk hiring. And the other part I would mention is we've written a lot since day one about how we operate outside. Of, and we do a lot of really funky stuff in terms of how the company is organized and all of that. And I think by publishing that amount of content, people can kind of self-select into Outsetta and they can say, this is you know, a way of working that resonates with me or not. And we see that already, like we have um, a huge backlog of people that want to work at Outsetta because they like how we operate the business. And it is quite different from what you see in uh, most of tech. That's a good point about while you're small, you, you have some competitive advantages that big companies don't have. And one of them is your Hiring can be way more personal. You can hire just from people you've worked from before, right? Like that only scales to maybe a dozen employees, depending sure. on how long your career has been. And yep. then after that, you need to figure out some other way. But at the beginning, you know, you can yep. take advantage of it and, um, and get hopefully higher quality people, or at least people who are known entities. Yeah. Um, but then you're 100 people, right? And what do you do then? So Yeah, my, my, my hope, to be honest with you, I... I I mean, if, if things explode, we could certainly end up at 100 employees. But my, my hope is that we don't. Um, we really, like looking back at our previous uh, SaaS company, something we said unanimously was we had a lot more fun at 20 employees than we did at 200. I think having that mindset sort of forces us to solve problems in a creative way too and say, you know, how can we, whatever the problem is, how can we solve it in a scalable way without just throwing people at the problem? Um, so that, that's actually something like I'm super excited about, um, 
Do you see any like existential threats remaining to your business right now? Like if you heard from a genie that like five years from now outside it went out of business, what do you think happened? So I, I think there's, there's two sides of this coin that I consider. Um, one of the most important reasons why we chose this specific idea is we were looking for an idea that, and, or just a market in general that I, I would describe as durable, meaning it's, it's not just going to disappear. Like th there's no question in my mind, at least that five or 10 or 15 years from now, people are going to need billing tools. People are going to need CRM. People are going to need email marketing. These are categories of software that are not just going to disappear. Uh, and that's why we were comfortable saying like, we're going to build this company over the long term, we're going to optimize everything for long term growth, we're going to do this for 15 or 20 years, and then call it quits. Um, that remains true today. But I do think, since we started, like a big part of the reason that we started out Seta was, uh, frankly, Stripe had great APIs for for payments. Uh, but they had really no tools that made it easy to get started with payments if you weren't a developer. And since, you know, since we started Stripe, frankly, has been like a couple years behind us in releasing a lot of the things that we've released, uh, but they've gotten there. They have really good no code billing tools that are very similar to what we offer today. And it's not just Stripe too. It's some of these other um, big companies that we have important relationships with. Webflow um, drives a huge percentage of our, our customer signups. They didn't have authentication tools and membership payments. Uh, they're in beta right now. They're being released in the next couple of months. But point being, you know, Stripe is kind of encroaching on our territory. Webflow is kind of encroaching on our territory. Um, Circle, uh, the community platform, is another is another one. They've been critical to our early growth. They've since released their own payment functionality. So I think you are seeing these other um, tech companies sort of launch their own payments tools. It, as I said, it is getting easier to integrate additional technologies with whatever it is you're using. So I think if there's an existential threat, it's like, you know, we're kind of playing this long game while these big venture backed companies are moving faster because they're big venture backed companies. And I think there's some risk to us in that. Uh, but that's mm -hmm. probably the closest thing to an existential threat that I would I would consider. It's the big guys just kind of squeeze you out by implementing yep. everything you do. Yep. Makes sense. And I think it's something that everybody is aware of, especially starting a bootstrap company is, you know, there's always going to be a size disadvantage of there's going to be giant VC backed companies with tons of money that are established players. And maybe one day they implement your product as a feature and sure. what you thought was a whole business turns out just be part of somebody's much larger business. Absolutely. Um, on the opposite side of that coin, like, what are you the most excited about right now? Like, over the next say six to six months to a year? Yeah, good, good question. I, I'm most excited about um, even just 2022 for me was like a huge exhale. Um, not in the sense that like we've made it by any means, but we got to the point where. Outseta is paying me like a livable, healthy salary at this point. Um, you know, we, as I said, we fought for three or four years to get this thing off the ground before we really started to grow in earnest. And in 2022 was kind of the year where like, we were like, okay, we can, we can breathe a little bit. We've got a business, we've got consistent revenue. Like this is good. Um, so I'm just like super excited to have made it to this position, to be perfectly frank. Uh, not that I'm not excited for the future, but at this point, like my mindset kind of shifts out of survival mode and into now I have a real opportunity to help this business grow in a big way. Like I'm the marketer here. This is like, I'm the one that's supposed to be driving growth. And to be frank, um, I haven't focused on growth in two, three years, really. Like I've been, doing operational stuff. I've been doing customer support. I've been doing product management. Like I've spent very little time on marketing. Um, and I'm like proud that I'm able to say that. And we've been able to grow because of the seeds that I planted early on um, as, a, as a marketer when we started the company. But I'm really excited to like get back to the basics and really focus on bringing out Seta to the masses in a much bigger way than I have over the last few years. Right on. 
All right, last question before we wrap things up here. Um, do you have any advice for the indie hacker starting out uh, that you'd like to share with the world? Yeah, I have, I have two things that are like the pieces of startup advice that I, I give every indie hacker founder for the most part. Um, the, the first one is uh, admittedly a little bit self-serving with our particular product, but without question, the number one thing that I see killing startups and I see startups die every single day is founders that just overcomplicate stuff necessarily, unnecessarily in the early stages of building their business. Mm -hmm. And it's not always related to payments, but I see this a lot with payments. People will come to us and they'll be like, we're getting ready to launch our product. We're three months out. We're going to have six different pricing tiers. There's going to be like these automatic upgrades between them. Um, you know, the, the price is going to scale down based on some particular metric and we need to build that all, you know, in outset in the next two weeks. Um, and it ends up being this thing that even if they can do it, they invest like four or six months, like building out this, ridiculous payment structure before they even have any customers. And like what I preach is like, why don't you just put up a landing page and say you can buy this early version of your product for $10 a month and see if you can sell it to a customer for $10 a month. Because if you can't sell it to a customer for $10 a month, this whole other pricing structure that you're talking about doesn't make any difference. Speed to market does matter a lot is probably the, um, the first thing that I would say. I, I think like you just need to get out of your own way. Beyond that, um, per, specific to SaaS, um, Mark Roberge was the initial head of sales or, or CRO at HubSpot, and he has kind of a framework uh, that he advises SaaS startups on, which is focus on customer success first, unit economic second, and then growth third. And if you do that, mm -hmm. you basically alleviate 90% of the headaches that come from trying to launch a SaaS business. And what that means in practice is like, Whatever you need to do to figure out how to make a customer successful, you do it. Even if it is completely unscalable, even if it is me, you know, working with you for 10 hours a day for a week to get you launched with our product successfully. If that's what it takes, you do that until you figure out how to make the customer successful. Then you have to turn your attention to, can we acquire uh, customers cost effectively? And only once you figure that out, can you say, okay, it's actually time to grow this thing. Whereas what you see in the startup world so often is here's our MVP, we're transitioning immediately into growth mode. And that's what creates mm -hmm. churn. That's what creates 90% of the problems that, that plague SaaS startups. I think that's good advice. And at the beginning too, like, and the beginning lasts a long time, as we said, like the beginning is years long. When you're doing this kind of handholding of your customers, they're telling you what they need, right? Every feature yeah. you build for them is probably hopefully a feature that lots of other people will need too right so it feels like you're giving a lot of attention to one user but if they're a prototypical sort of user yep. and they represent the needs of a lot of potential customers as you won't have to handhold next time because you've updated your docs you've created a new feature that works better and you're getting some incremental improvements that that give you better time leverage than it might feel like in the moment absolutely true and i, I think you made a really good point there too about making sure it is like who your ideal customer profile um, sh should be. Like the other trap I see all the time is, you know, people do fall into this, let's listen to this customer wants and build the features that they need, but they're just doing it for that customer because it's whoever happened to show up at their door and express interest in their product. Uh, but if it's not their ideal customer, then you're building this feature set that doesn't matter for the people that should be using your product. So uh, that's a good point too. Mm. Yeah, definitely easy to fall into the trap of, oh, they said they would buy it if I if I yep. just built <laughs> But totally. oh, they're not actually paying me yet. So, <laughs> are they actually your customer? Yep. Are they just a one-off? It takes some, um, just like market awareness, I guess, to figure out who you're talking to. Are they actually representing a hundred different people that will buy sure. your product in the future, or are they a one-off with like their own weird needs that aren't super relevant? Um, it's not always so easy to tell the difference. Um, well, all right, Jeff, thanks so much for coming on. Um, thanks for being such a mensch with the onboarding. And where can we go find out more about yourself? Uh, you can find me, um, if you ever want to email me, it's just jeff at outsider.com. Um, my name is spelled G-E-O-F-F. -F. I'm a G-off, so uh, just make note of that. 
Um, you can find me on Twitter. Like at the giraffe J- from Toys R Us, right? That That's it. TV. You got it. Absolutely. <laughs> um, at, at Jeff T. Roberts on Twitter, uh, or you can check us out at outsider.com. <laughs>